You'd never know it, but there's a side of quarrying nobody ever sees. When the sun sets and the crews leave, when the gates lie locked and the site sits silent and still, quarries offer up their secrets to those who know where to look. Welcome to the secret life of quarries. For machines like these, maintenance is medicine. Regular health checks, scans and tests help spot potential problems, so they can be treated before they cause trouble. Hearts are listened to. Blood samples are taken and tested. Bones and joints are checked, and muscles and reflexes put through their paces. But what happens if we don't do regular maintenance? If machines are made to run and run with no thought given to their health? Modern quarrying machines are miracles of engineering, but no machine lasts forever. Even with the best operators, tires wear, teeth blunt, engines choke, and parts fail. With too little maintenance, Every wheel loader, excavator, and hauler will eventually grind to a halt. On the other hand, every moment a mostly healthy machine spends in the workshed costs us in lost production. We need to weigh up the costs of maintenance, scheduled downtime, versus the costs of catastrophic machine failure, unscheduled downtime. Let's start with the latter because the costs of unscheduled downtime vary depending on the machine in question. If a primary loader goes down, the entire operation is at risk. Haulers have no material to move and begin to queue up in front of any remaining loaders. The crusher runs empty and belts run bare. Quarrying stops. Haulers typically work in groups of four or more, so losing a single machine is unlikely to entirely halt the flow of rock across the quarry. Once again, the crusher may run hungry, and loaders in the yard may spend as much time idling as working, burning time and money needlessly. And while quarrying may continue, by reducing the number of working trucks by a quarter, we reduce throughput and profits by the same amount. Under normal circumstances, the crusher is rarely still. But should the crusher fall ill, it doesn't take long for things to go wrong. Fully loaded trucks arrive, one after another, with nowhere to dump their rock. They may elect to create intermediate stockpiles near the crusher, but this is only ever a short-term solution. Before long, there's a new pile of ready-to-crush rock and ever more fully laden trucks. Even when the crusher is back on its feet, there's a huge backload to work through, and wheel loaders must take time away from the rock face to load the stockpiled material directly into the crusher. A yard loader going down is perhaps the least damaging scenario. There will almost always be several other machines to carry on the work, and production may only suffer slightly. However, the real risk here is to our quarry's reputation. If the machine's absence increases customer wait time by even the smallest amount, we begin to cost them money, and even a few minutes' delay for a few days could be enough to drive a customer to another quarry. Catastrophic failures, spontaneous breakdowns, and on-the-job accidents are collectively known as unscheduled downtime. The alternative is scheduled downtime, or maintenance, and as we'll see, it's a far better idea. The idea behind scheduled downtime is repair before failure. 
Machines and parts are taken out of the production line and repaired, rebuilt, or replaced before they can fail. This is trickier than it sounds. Firstly, every minute a machine spends away from the quarry is a minute of potentially lost production. So maintenance should be coordinated with a quarry's production plan or, if possible, take place outside of normal working hours altogether. Secondly, every component, system and machine has a different lifespan depending on design and workload. Run maintenance too often and we waste both time and money. Schedule it too seldom and we risk equipment failure and unscheduled downtime. To find the best balance, we need to know how close each part is to failure, a process called condition monitoring. Condition monitoring is the foundation of the repair before failure approach. The aim is to keep parts and machines going for as long as possible and minimize unscheduled downtime. At the heart of condition monitoring is regular inspection and scheduled oil sampling. Operators run daily inspections, checking visually for fluid levels, GET condition, tire wear or punctures, physical damage or oil leaks. Sound, touch and even smell are important too. Engines and moving parts are listened to, vibration felt for, and any scent of smoke or oil noted. Beyond this, periodic deep checks, the equivalent of an annual physical, should be scheduled at 250, 500, or even 1,000 hour intervals. Filters and fluids should be changed, and samples of transmission, axle, hydraulic, or engine oil taken for testing. Scheduled oil sampling, or SOS, is the wide-spectrum blood test of machinery, identifying hidden problems before they can become dangerous. Modern equipment is stuffed full of sensors. Machines monitor themselves at all times, and engines, transmission systems, and even tires can sense when something is wrong and transmit a warning to the operator. The first step is to alert the operator. A light flashes up, attracting attention and showing that something is wrong. If this is not heeded quickly, a loud buzzer sounds. If the fault still persists, a fault code is sent to a customer's or dealer's monitoring system, telling them that a certain part has a certain problem and that the operator has not yet shut the machine down, all within minutes of the issue being detected. This reliance on data extends to more and more equipment every year, with ever more machinery requiring regular software updates, either through a hard-linked computer or remotely through the air. Both maintenance and repair require specialist knowledge, serious manpower, and a lot of expensive equipment. Purpose-built repair facilities like this one can fix or maintain practically anything, but are often expensive. If you have access to a tooled up workshed, an overhead crane, a wash bay, and all the staff and equipment these need, you might well be able to handle things in-house. But in reality, having such a wealth of resources on site is rare. Modern machines need broad skill sets to maintain, from software proficiency and programming ability to mechanical know-how and welding certifications. Training technicians is costly, time-consuming, and requires external experts. Parts matter too. If bought in and stored on site, they take up room, take time and money to manage, and require a significant investment of funds up front. Taken all together, it's no surprise that many quarries choose to hand their whole maintenance operation to someone else. External experts, usually dealers, agree to provide a certain level of maintenance, condition monitoring, and repair before failure work for one or more machines. Such external services are agreed upon and signed into being 
via documents known as customer value agreements, which clearly set out costs, timings and services provided. And once we know who is looking after what, we must turn our attention to one of the hardest jobs of all, maximizing machine uptime in the first place. From working conditions to worker skills, there are at least a dozen different factors that influence how long a machine or component can keep running. Simple factors include operator skills, site setup, haul road conditions, blast quality, site support, site stock, technician skills, tooling, contamination control, maintenance plans, component replacement plans, production and maintenance planning, and overloading of equipment. When it comes to keeping every possible part and machine running for as long as possible, everyone has a role, from operators to site managers. Processes need to be well orchestrated and defined. Machines and equipment must be right for the job and right for each other in form, function and size. Broadly speaking, there are five levels of repair. Let's take an engine as an example. A level one repair would involve filter and oil changes, plus oiling of bearings. A level two repair would repair or replace larger or more complex components such as pistons. At level three, things are more costly and time-consuming. Major parts may need to be stripped down and others replaced. By level four, repair is no longer feasible and entire parts or systems are replaced with previously repaired reman equivalents. Finally, at level five, there is no option but to replace the component or system entirely with a new equivalent. Wherever possible, level three, four or five repairs should be avoided, in large part by ensuring level one and two repairs are undertaken as soon as required. Because generally speaking, the higher the repair level, the higher the cost. Repair before failure isn't just a nice idea. It has real applications in real life. In one case, a machine was given cause for concern, issued a red alert, and was shut down by the site manager. An inspection of the air intake discovered a cracked hose. The part was replaced and the machine returned to the line. Had the small initial fault not been noticed and fixed, the engine itself would have failed, perhaps permanently, costing more than 50 times as much and keeping the machine offline for far longer. On another occasion, a different machine delivered a fault code, issued a red alert, and was shut down by the site manager. An immediate inspection found a leaking fuel transfer pump. Again, the part was replaced with a minimum of fuss and the machine returned to the line. In this case, fixing the original fault before the damage could transfer to the engine avoided a total engine loss that would have cost a staggering 80 times as much and taken the machine out of production for significantly longer. Overall, regular maintenance and servicing can do more than just keep machines running. They can keep the entire operation profitable from start to end because the secret of maintenance is to fix things before they break.